as primarily a social movement scholar. And I not surprisingly went back to the imprinting literature. And I started thinking a little bit about why it is that I, somebody who's a professor in a business school, actually cares at all about social movements. And I was thinking about the following. First, a story that my mother told me about 1968. Um, I was an infant. And she went off to the Democratic National Convention in Chicago to protest. And she told me that at this event, she ended up coming home early. And, and she came home early because she was afraid. She had this irrational fear that she may break her leg. And there, there she would have to be going up and down the house, uh, the stairs in the house with an infant with a broken leg. Oops. So it went too fast for everybody else, but I think maybe we have to do this. Oh, it went. Okay, good. Uh, okay, a couple of years ago, a couple of years after that, um, this was a fairly common sight when I was growing up. This, uh, for those of you who are from the United States, will recognize Bread and Pupper, Puppet Theater. It was born at the college that my mother and stepfather worked at, and I went to all kinds of protest events with these large, beautiful puppets. They're still around. You'll still see them at protest events. This was an anti-Vietnam War protest. My mother also took me to a lot of protests for the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, in the 1970s, we, as many of you know from the United States, we were working to get this ratified as a constitutional amendment. Lots of states mobilized, and I spent a lot of time in Vermont at equal rights protests. And then in college, anti-apartheid, which became the subject of my dissertation and the shantytown movement. So why am I interested in social movements? Because they were imprinted on me as a person, as a scholar, as a young human being. But then I went to graduate school in 1989. And of course, I was not surprisingly substantively interested in social movements, but I fell in love with organizational theory. And what was a, what's a young scholar to do at this point? And I was really lucky, actually, because at Cornell at this time period, there were scholars such as Pam Tolbert that I was taking org theory classes from, Mike Hannon, who I was also taking org theory classes from, and Sid Tarot and Susan Olzak that I was taking classes on social movements from. And it was really just a natural, um, I think, to bring these two together. And I'm taking liberties here because it's really not 30 years. Normally, I don't like to add a year to my life, but I'm going to do it because 30 years, 20, you know, 29, whatever. Um, and I want to talk about five themes that have animated pretty much everything I've done with social movements. And these all come from organizational theory. The really good thing is I can do this kind of quickly because Woody, Larka, and Huggy all actually talked about some of these themes. So I don't have to go into a whole lot of depth with the theme, but I want to, I want to sort of in, um, impose on you that these themes have animated pretty much everything I've done. And the first theme has to do with boundary activation. And in particular, thinking about some of the work that came from early ecological theory, came from some of the work later on that Michelle Lamont um, had done, and thinking a little bit about how competition influences boundaries, which then influences collective action of various sorts. Also thinking a lot about competition and concentration and how we can think about that and how that impacts uh, collective action. And so some of the, uh, the, the earliest paper that I ever wrote in 1992 um, was a paper that looked at, took seriously some of these issues of boundary activation and how threat competition, threat and competition um, drives boundaries and drives collective action, in particular thinking about race and ethnic groups and thinking about economic and political competition for resources and how that drives collective action and in this case, collective violence against African Americans. Similar uh, work done a little bit later on at Arizona with PhD students students, again, really trying to interrogate and take from the organization's literature ideas about competition, threat, and how that drives behavior. And again, in this case, um, uh, behavior uh, 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 arson against black churches in the U.S. And still even uh, the, one of the first papers that I published when I moved to Stanford was about um, how police, active police who get threatened at protest events, 
react negatively towards African Americans <clears throat> and protesting while black. Now, another sort of way to think about boundaries and think about the way in which competition drives various kinds of actions is that another paper that um, looks at the way in which takes sort of social movements as organizations. That's another theme in a lot of the work that I've done. And rather than thinking about just protest, thinking about movement organizations as the phenomenon of study and interrogating the question of how we can bring organizational ecology and in particular resource partitioning theory to bear on thinking about organizational um, uh, social movement organizations. And in this paper, we studied three different protest industries, women's, uh, peace and environment, and we brought to bear questions of how competition drives both specialization of various kinds of organizations and how specialization then drives survival rates of organization. I'll skip that one because I'll come back to that one. Another one that, you know, Woody already mentioned this theme. He talked about how it is that movements get inside organizations and impact what it is that organizations do or impact what goes on within organizations. And a lot of the work that I've done around this sort of issue has to do with boundary crossing and boundary permeability, if you will. Thinking about how we can think about social movements as bounded industry, industry entities as industries, as bounded entities, and also thinking about what might happen when boundary crossing happens or how we can think about the permeability of the boundary around an organization with respect to movements. And a recent paper that I uh, presented to the ScanCorp uh, crew here and got a lot of feedback a couple of years ago. Some of you will remember it. I also presented it at the PhD workshop a couple of years ago. Um, was a paper on thinking about osmotic mobilization. And in this paper, we look at protest outside of organizations and how that protest influenced internal union mobilization within organizations. So thinking about how, as Woody said, how protest outside of organizations impacts what's going on inside of organizations. Another theme really about this is thinking about ways in which we can think about the, move, the, the, the boundaries around specific movements and how those influence the way in which, uh, or how, how those, the, the fuzziness of those boundaries influence what goes on in terms of how the whole entire social movement sector of a country changes over time. And in this paper, we're able to look at things like status similarity and status differences of organizations and, how, and issues and how those influence what happens in the entire field of social movement issues in the United States over time. We begin to see in some of this work the uh, attempt to bring in field level theories and embeddedness to some of these arguments as well. And then in a recent paper, in fact, that some of you who were um, with us in Copenhagen uh, about two months ago um, that I presented is a paper with Huggy and a former student from here from Stanford, Dan Wong. And in this paper, what we're doing is another, it's another field level analysis, but it's an attempt to look at what happens with the configuration of organizations in, social movement organizations, by the way, within a specific um, industry or field. And what we do is we look at how the level of cohesion and focus of those organizations within a specific social movement industry influences what it is that organizations do with respect to diversification. So here we begin to borrow on some of the theories of um, movement, or of, of organizational diversification and try to bring these to bear on social movement um, industries and social movement organizations. The emergence. Woody talked about emergence too. Another big theme in some of the work that I've done is looking at how new tactics emerge from uh, it within a social movement sector and also thinking about the emergence of new organizations, the birth of new social movement organizations. And in another paper with um, Dan Wong, one of the things that we've attempted to do is bring some of the work that's been done about um, thinking about field level effects and thinking about where in a 
uh, it, where in a field we're likely to see innovation in terms of tactics. And we define innovation in two different ways. We define innovation as innovation that comes because we're bringing together a couple of different kinds of um, uh, tactics, very different tactics, and then we think about de, de novo tactics as well. And we find that de novo tactics, the brand new tactics, emerge in the periphery of the network and that we're likely to see these sort of more combinatorial kinds of um, innovation coming from the center of the network. Uh, I mentioned this paper a little bit before, but again, a paper that looks at how it is that the sector level dynamics and looking at institutional theory, ecology theory, embeddedness theory impacts both protest rates and the emergence of new organizations. I only have two more to do of these, but then I'll make some more general points. Diffusion and learning. Some of the, the work that I've done around diffusion and learning really f is inspired and has been inspired by many of the people in this room. Um, in, 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 in this work, we typically have looked at borrowing really heavily from John, where'd he go? John Meyer's work, early, er, work on uh, indirect and direct uh, forms of diffusion. Some of the early pieces of this had to do with thinking about state level uh, diffusion of various kinds of welfare policies, same-sex marriage policies, a number of different policies that I looked at, bringing to bear, thinking about how indirect kinds of networks, culturally constructed similarity between different entities drives the diffusion of policies. In this case, they were around states, state policies. Similarly, thinking about the, uh, the, the sort of more global system, thinking about divestment from Burma by multinational companies and how indirect connections and culturally connected, um, uh, cultural connections between various uh, states and um, firms impacted the diffusion of uh, multinational corporations from Burma. And then finally, a more recent piece that looks at direct, starts to begin to look at direct organizational learning from different social movement organizations. So again, another piece that takes some of the theories that we all know, that we've all read, and instead tries to bring these to bear on a, a specifically social movement phenomenon. I'll skip that one because it's a similar um, diffusion piece. And then finally, signaling. This came out in virtually all of the papers that we talked about. Ways in which we can think about bringing to bear some of the work that's been done in organizational theory on signaling on social movement kinds of um, phenomenon. And the, the, this, some of this work is very recent, and I'll talk about that piece a little bit more because it's ex not just recent but extremely important for this week in the United States. The first of these has to do with thinking about taking both um, work that's been done about signaling, uh, cognitive signaling, but also work that we um, know from the categories and identities literature and how we can think about how different kinds of protest events impact lawmakers differently. And so one example of this comes from a piece that a former PhD student here and I wrote about women's protest in the United States and how it impacted congressional decisions and attention to issues. And the kind of bottom line of this was we took some of the signaling work that's been done on signaling um, that looks at the sort of the, the, the kind of strength of a signal and the impacts a strength of a signal has on, um, on some kind of a decision. But we also brought to bear some of the categories and identities literature to talk about fuzziness or clarity of a signal and how that impacts what it is that how, how decisions are made. And the sort of bottom line is kind of in the table, in the title, loud and clear. It's important to have both loud and clear signals if you want, if as a protest movement you want to have an impact. Another piece that really takes uh, the issue of uh, signaling to bear is a piece that we uh, wrote a few years ago that looks at the um, effects of protest on what organizations do and how that in turn impacts what it is that further future protest does by sending signals. Woody made uh, reference to some um, thinking a little bit about receptivity of organizations. This is a paper that really tries to dig at how does protest impact the receptivity of organizations and that and how does that in turn influence um, future protest? And now 
the last piece that I wanted to just mention, and this is the piece that I want to talk a little bit about because this is incredibly important to what's going on right now in the United States and what we might um, predict about Tuesday and our midterm elections. Uh, this is a paper, we've all had this happen, a journal sat on it forever and ever and ever, and I was incredibly irritated this past summer and I sent a uh, not, not as, as harsh a letter as I ever write to anybody, but it said, Dear Journal Editor, are you still even a journal? <laughs> because it, they'd been sitting on this for about two years. And then the next thing we knew, they uh, published this piece. And the takeaway from this piece, this is uh, a piece that I wrote with a political scientist at Penn, Daniel Gillian. And the piece essentially looks at longitudinal, it's historical, it's not contemporary, but if we believe in path dependence, we can have some hope uh, for Tuesday. And the essential finding in this paper is that protest... And by protest, we mean large, salient, violent, loud, clear protest influences voter share. So left-leaning protest is likely to increase the Democratic turnout and vote share for Democratic candidates. We also find the same, actually, on uh, the right, the side of the right as well. But it also increases the um, probability and the likelihood that a um, quality challenger will enter a contested race. And for those of you in the United States and those of you maybe who have been following um, what's been going on, we have certainly seen the latter in this particular um, midterm election. We have seen, and especially, and again, correlation is not causation, but you've probably noticed in the United States that we've had unprecedented levels of women's protest since um, President Trump was elected. And we've also seen unprecedented numbers of quality women challengers entering uh, House races in this election. So that's one thing to sort of think about. And then the last piece of this is we've also seen unprecedented levels in recent times, certainly, of left-leading protest. And so I remain um, optimistic, and I'm saying it loudly here, that we can hope that on Tuesday uh, we might see some change in some of the elections that we have. Could be wrong, and you'll all laugh at me, but let's say, yeah, but yeah we want to all, you know, say, say that. So this is a piece, I think, yes, loud and clear. We want this uh, to happen. So um, despite the fact that I was irritated that the journal did not publish this piece um, quickly, I'm actually pleased that it came out at this particular time because it's gotten some little bit of press anyway. And then uh, I'll just skip this one. That's another signaling one. Next steps, well... I'll say two things very quickly because I want to make sure we leave some time for discussion and still have time to go have um, our wine. Uh, the first thing, the next steps when I think about this, there are two things that are going on. One, and Huggy's going to grin when he hears this, um, one of our colleagues who's in the finance group, who's a friend of both of ours, Amit Saru, has, a, has um, studied misconduct in finance, and particularly amongst financial advisors, and has assembled an unbelievably incredible data set about this. What I'm really interested in doing with these data, and Amit and I are going to do this together, one of the great things about um, being at the business school here is that you end up being able to collaborate with people who are radically different in terms of um, training, that uh, we are going to look at how social movements um, in influence the uh, uh, how influence inf how social movements influence how misconduct becomes scandal, and so that's one piece that we're working on. And the other one is a little bit more subversive. He's going to grin at me now, but is a little bit more subversive. And um, one of the things that has happened in the last year is that the business school has um, appointed me as the person who's supposed to look over diversity and inclusion for the whole business school. And uh, it turns out, after spending about a year studying this and figuring out what's going on is um, that there's been a social movement at the business school amongst our staff, our, our courageous and innovative staff. And one of the things that I'm planning on doing is um, capitalizing on that and studying this because one of the things that I've learned in the last year is that we are actually very far ahead of many of our peer institutions with respect to diversity and inclusion. And it's been fully a movement from within. So that's my other mischievous one that he'll tease me about. So, okay. I'm, that was very quick. I will open it up for discussion, and I, will you moderate, Woody? Okay. Questions? 